Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, uh, well, in today's story, we got one of the webs of lies, got a deadly obsession, and we have a, what are those, you know, a, a love triangle, which, which pretty swiftly becomes like a love line, and then just like, like a dot. So. In the early 2000s, a couple of fine folk were at Purdue Pharma. Thanks for the opioid crisis, lads. And there were locked eyes, there were love hearts, there was romance, there were sticky fingers. But there was also one problem. There happened to be, like, kind of other people in the picture. But that's what erasers are there for. And by erasers, I mean blindfolds, games, and knives. This is the insane story of Sheila Davalu. So let's give it a go. Stafford, Connecticut is where this story takes us. The city of about 130,000 people sits on the Long Island Sound and is home to a heck and heck of a lot of corporations, Fortune 500 companies, financial services, technology, healthcare. They all like gathered around Stanford and were warming their hands against the low business tax rate. And sure, why wouldn't you? It's also, you know, close to New York City. It has a well-educated population and most importantly, wealthy investors. And that is where Anna Lisa Raimondo, she lived. Anna Lisa was born in Brooklyn, New York, growing up there with her mother, Susan, father Renato, and her brother and sister, before heading off to Harvard, bright spark that she was. And then she grabbed one of them a master's degrees at Columbia, Ivy League all the way. She was bright spark, she was athletic, she was pretty, she, she had it all. Damn them having it all, people. So things couldn't be better for Miss Raimundo, and they only seemed to be going, getting better. I'll only own up. There's a swift drop-off point. She went on to get a sweet-ass gig as a pharmaceutical executive, which came with the big old dollar dues, hence the sick ride, the big condo. Two stories. Whatever she wanted. She was successful, and she knew it. She took advantage of it. She was living her best life, as they say. Who says that? I don't know. So her life sounds great. How do I get me one of those? You won't be saying that though by the end of, sadly by the end of this tale. Annalisa had love too. She met and fell in love with co-worker at Purdue Pharma, a guy named Nelson Sessler. Now Purdue Pharma is, is located essentially in what is downtown Stanford, and they make a lot of them good old pharmaceuticals. Drugs, 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 ladies and gentlemen, focusing on like pain management medication. Of course, they sold plenty of opioids and were very pushy for, for doctors to prescribe them to patients when they weren't uh, needed. You know, it, it was one of, it, 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 I mean, I guess it kind of still is, like one of those situations where these drugs are not insanely addictive, wink, wink. These drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. This led to lawsuits, of course, and billions of dollars in settlements and yada, yada, yada. But we ain't here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the other drug. The drug of love. Annalisa and Nelson were kind of different people. Her adventurous and outgoing, him more of a subdued type of lad, and they kept a relationship on the hush-hush as they were co-workers. They were serious, or at least on the road to it. They weren't quite at the talk of marriage point, but you could, you could see it from here. And so, with things getting pretty real, in early November 2002, Annalisa and Nelson, they planned to go out with a, with a load of other couples out in New York City. It was like, I guess, not like double date, but like a quadruple date. Sure. But they never showed. Friends would try and call Annalisa all night to no avail. That's because at that very moment, on that very day, the police were in Anna Lisa's apartment. There had been an attack. The door to her seaside condo was open, and inside the place was trashed, and Anna Lisa lay on the ground. She'd been beaten and stabbed to death. Anna Lisa Raimundo was only 32 years of age. Annalisa had fought for her life before being violently murdered. There were no signs of 4th century, not that there has to be, 
But that indicated she opened the door to her killer, and perhaps knew them. Nothing seemed stolen from the condo. It didn't appear to have been a burglary gone wrong. You know, someone breaks in, they get discovered, they try silencing Annalisa. No, it seemed to be a one mode of crime. The motive being the murder of Anna Lisa Raimondo. Blood was found all over Annalisa, but also in the bathroom sink, which investigators thought could have been the perpetrator's blood. The killer, in their frenzied attack, had injured themselves, which is, which is actually extremely common when you're wielding a knife willy nilly. And then, then uh, after killing Annalisa, the the killer had washed, tried to wash off their, their own blood. And so the investigation started with, well, where does it always start to start with? You know, big dog, you know, Nelson Sessler, the boyfriend. Where was he that day? Did he murder his getting serious with girlfriend? In fact, while the police were at the house, Nelson, or at the condo, Nelson rocked up, ready to take her out on that big old date. Was he showing the, oh geez, oh boy, oh geez, returning to the scene of the crime? So the police, you know, they, they told him the incredibly tragic news, they sat him down, and Nelson did not seem to upset really about it. Now, that's always something that kind of comes up in these cases, right? How somebody reacts to hearing this kind of news. And, well, everybody reacts differently to trauma, right? Some people are just in shock. It doesn't even register what you've just told them. In fact, if you did kill somebody, you would think, you know, the whole thing, oh, he didn't seem too upset. If you killed somebody, you would try and be more upset, right? To be like, oh, no. But, you know, we, police looked into Nelson. He had no reason to try and murder Annalisa. They checked where he was that day. His alibi was pretty tight. He was seen, you know, in Purdue Pharma, the CCTV, going into work that morning, leaving that evening. He was wearing the same clothes all day. And whoever attacked Annalisa would have been covered head to toe in blood. And he was not. His clothes were clean. He was away when it's believed she was attacked. He was clear. Witnesses would say that day they saw a man skulking about, a man named Gary Riley. Now this Gary Riley, he was known kind of around town for a lot of petty crimes, and he was seen hanging around uh, this apartment building that day, and he had a loud ass mouth on him. He would always, he was telling people all oh, about the murder and shit like this after the fact, but a lot of his information was playing up wrong, and the police looking into him, it turned out he was, he was just that. He was a mouth. It didn't seem like he knew Annalisa Raimondo at all, or he had been the one to get into her house and, and kill her, and she wouldn't have let him in. So after like a brief investigation into him, he was discarded as a suspect. Now the reason the crime was even discovered, like at all, right, why were the police there before Nelson was, was because of a 911 call. This 911 call. Answer, please. Hello. A guy is, is attacked my neighbor. You think someone attacked your neighbor? Yes, yes. I heard yelling. I heard yelling. What is your friend's name? I don't know her name. She's my neighbor. She lives in 105. You don't know your friend? Hello? The person didn't identify themselves, just said a neighbor was being attacked. And in fact, they gave the address. You know, saying, oh, my neighbor's being attacked in this address. They actually gave the wrong address. It wasn't Annalisa Raimondo's apartment, but the police, the door was wide open. They swiftly found it. When the operator tried to call this mysterious person back, it turned out that the call had been made from a payphone near a restaurant, not far from Annalisa's home. No one saw who made that 911 call, though alerting the police to the attack. The police canvassed the building, meeting neighbors. None matched the caller, though. And the caller said it was a male who did this, but they were chasing their tail trying to find the caller and this mysterious male intruder. That call, though, very suspicious. And who, who made that call remained unknown. It would remain that way, caller unknown and case unsolved for five long ass months. Then things started heating up again into this case. And this is when things kind of like take a nosedive from tragic unsolved murder into. This is batshit. In a hospital just across the border in New York, about a 25 minute drive from Stanford, a couple came in. This was in March 2003, five months after Anna Lisa's murder. The husband had been viciously stabbed all over his chest. He'd been stabbed three times. Now the wife was saying there had been an accident. 
he came and he said, "Look here," and he laid on he laid on the floor, and he's like, "Can you look at it to see if it's bleeding?" And I I get nauseous when I look at blood. I couldn't look at it. The husband is saying something that very very differently about what had happened to him. He said, "Put on the porn music." That him and his wife had been playing some sort of some sort of game. All right, it involved handcuffs. It involved blindfolds. And it involved knives. You had me and then you lost me. He told the police he'd been handcuffed and he'd been blindfolded, sitting in a chair, full chub, when his wife started stabbing him. This had been part of a game they sometimes played together. The object of the game was to guess what item your partner was touching you with. So I'm guessing, you know, doing a bit of thinking here, the wife, you know, got the knife and was like, well, stabbing you is touching you. Guess what this is? The husband's name was Paul Christos, and his wife's name was Sheila Davalou. And it was, allegedly, an accident. She got carried away with it. Paul said he believed it to have been, like, yeah, just an accident. She got dizzy, or she, she fell knife first into him a few times. Paul said his wife was was panicked when it happened when she when she stabbed him you know accidentally, and that you know uh, he he got her to call nine one one and and that the panicked demeanor he said his wife had kind of fit with when the police questioned her about what had happened. Yeah, but they called someone to tell me about the game because they already know about it. We were just playing the game. Yeah, they were having a game. Yeah, I love this so much. Well, tell me, I want to hear what happened. You had a great day. You told me you had a great day. Don't, 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 I don't want you to be embarrassed. I am embarrassed, and I don't want to talk about this. I'm not at all. I just want to... No, I mean, you think I did it. Well, I think something went wrong. Yeah, I'm not saying... Something went terribly wrong, but I didn't... I'm not saying it was intense. I'm just saying that I don't want to talk about this. Well, I'm not saying that. I just got an account where he's giving me a story that we're playing a game, everything's fine. And then he gets hurt. Now what's she going to understand an accident happened and he's blindfolded and he said, you know, something went wrong, and, you know. But I'm trying to understand the second death, which I know didn't occur at the same time the first one did. And I know he didn't do it to himself because it wasn't possible. It was possible for him to do it to himself. Paul, by the way, he would go on to make a full recovery after having open heart surgery. So he would be great. No harm, no foul. No harm, no fell, though, to the point when the police didn't think that, though, when they started looking in to make sure this was what they were both saying it was. Because, interestingly enough, her cell phone was found to have never called 911. In fact, her phone did make a call after she accidentally stabbed her husband, Paul Christos. Her phone was found to have made a call to... Dun dun dun... Nelson Sessler. Bereaved boyfriend of Anna Lisa Raimundo. Cases interlinked, interlinked. Why would she call him though? How would she even know who the shit Nelson was? Now, when Nelson was questioned about his relationship with Sheila, he eventually admitted they were in a sexual relationship. Nice. He had been having an affair with her. And not only that, she too worked for Purdue Pharma, the same company as Nelson and Annalisa. There had been some inter, or is it intra, I don't know, office. Romance going on here, resulting in two stabbings, one of them fatal. Nelson would say he had been seeing both Annalisa and Sheila at the same time, but he broke things off with Sheila when he started getting more serious with Annalisa. He would say the relationship with Sheila wasn't much more than a summer fling. This is a bit weird that the three of them, though, were dating and they all worked together and kind of, well, Annalisa and Sheila, well, Sheila knew. Nelson was dating Annalisa, but Annalisa didn't know anything about Sheila. Though maybe this was more than a summer fling for Sheila, because after Annalisa, Annalisa Raimundo's murder, she got back with Nelson. She was in there like swimwear. And Nelson had no idea Sheila was married to Paul Christmas. Nelson had no idea there was a husband in the picture, in the picture of this at all. He thought Sheila was single like a Pringle, and let me tell you that. So Paul and Nelson had no idea. There's like five, four, Four people, all kind of like, it's messy. But the affairer becomes the affairy. Now Sheila and her family moved to the United States in the late 1970s. They'd come from Iran and escaped during the Iranian Revolution. 
they had moved to New York and Sheila went on to follow in her parents' footsteps, studying biochemistry and would eventually land a job at the pharmaceutical company, working with Nelson and Annalisa. Also due to tradition, Sheila married when she was very young, straight out of school, to a man named Farid Musavi. Now that didn't last too long, her very first marriage, as I said, when Sheila would have been very young, straight out of school, that marriage to Farid didn't last long at all because during the marriage she began seeing somebody. She began having an affair. She began having an affair with Paul Christos, who she would later marry in 2001. And then of course then, approximately two years later, she began, she met and she began working with, <laughs> she had definitely fucking loved having affairs, Nelson Sessler. Now as I said, Nelson had no idea Sheila was married, so I guess he didn't really think he was doing anything wrong other than cheating on Annalisa. And Nelson would come over to Sheila's place all the time to, you know, do the dirty. But this is really, really weird. So Sheila was married to Paul, and what Sheila would tell Paul to get him out of there was to tell Paul her mentally ill brother was coming to visit, and he would not be too keen on finding out that Sheila was married or even in a relationship with another man. So Paul would have to pack up all his shit, photographs, all his items, this, that, and the other, pack it all up, he would leave and go stay with his parents' house, so then when Nelson came over, it didn't look like a man lived here at all. What? Another thing that was interesting was that Sheila, the balls on his broad, she would tell her husband Paul about a love triangle that was going on at work. But of course she wasn't involved in this love triangle. She, well she would tell Paul the story about what was going on and of course she told Paul that a Melissa, wink wink, who was Sheila, was dating a, a Jack, who was Nelson, who was dating an Annalisa, she actually used her real name. She would constantly talk about this to anybody who would listen. But of course all this ended when Nelson dumped Sheila to be with Annalisa and then Annalisa was murdered. Sheila would say she was helping Melissa spy on Annalisa and that she wanted to break into her house to steal some photographs. And of course, Annalisa ends up dead and Sheila is back having an affair with Nelson in no time at all. And when Sheila and Paul were playing the, the, the game and when you know, she stabbed him, she stabbed him twice. And then he's asking her to call 911 as he's bleeding out on the carpet. Sheila didn't do that. She did, Sheila did not call 911. She called Nelson. In fact, she invited him over for dinner while her husband is tied up, bleeding out on, on, the, on, the, on the floor. And now Nelson couldn't make it, so Sheila's like, all right, fine, I'll take you to the hospital, fine. After, after an hour of him lying on the ground, stabbed two times, twice. So she drives him to the hospital in Westchester and in the hospital parking lot. She stabbed him again. In Sheila Davalou's home, the police found night vision goggles, stun guns, and a lock picking kit. Her obsession with Nelson drove her to this. In November 2002, she arrived at Annalise's home to kill her so she could have Nelson all to herself. And then later, she tried to kill her husband to get him out of the picture. In 2007, five years after Annalise's death, she was arrested and charged with murder. At trial, Sheila would represent herself. Apparently she was very, very good, uh, you know, to argue against the, the circumstantial evidence that she was the one who killed Annalisa Raimundo. She would even cross-examine her now ex, ex-husband at this time, Paul Christos, and she would cross-examine Nelson. This is a case where I am being accused of killing somebody. The prosecution argued she was a manipulative person who killed for a man she was obsessed with. She was the one who called 911 to lead the police in the wrong direction, to look for a man who killed Annalisa. And it may have worked if she hadn't tried to murder her husband to get him out of the picture too. And it was the cut on her hand which gave the prosecution some real evidence. Her blood was found on the sink in Annalisa's place, and a friend noticed Sheila had a cut on her hand later that day. But that was it. Other than that, no fingerprints, hair, or anything else. No hair evidence, no fingerprints. Search of my car yielded nothing. Did the state prove to you that I was there on that day? Well, they can't do that. And in fact, then Sheila was arguing it was all circumstantial evidence. There was no even um, way to prove that the blood that was found on the sink, her blood, her like one little tiny drop of blood that was found on the sink in Annalise's home, there was no way to say that got there the day Annalise was killed. Maybe she had been over to Annalise's place before and whatever. Sheila Davalou even called Gary Riley, 
up to, to, to stand in her defense to because he said he didn't see her there that day at all, uh, that 911 call. Some friends would be humming and hawing over where whether they believed it was her. You know, some people who knew Sheila well, some would say, oh, kind of sounds kind of like her in parts, but not all the time. Although, I mean, how hard is it to... Yeah, she's a man killing somebody. See, I can even change my voice like a chameleon. As I said, she cross-examined the two loves in her life. Well, kind of just really, Nelson. She argued she never tried to kill Paul Christos. You had previously stated that when I lunged at you, I looked distressed. There, there, I had a distressed look on my face. Correct. Correct. And you have uh, previously stated that I looked kind of crazy at that time. Crazy, angry, correct. And insinuated that Nelson may have been the one to kill Annalisa. I hadn't told them that uh, you had been my girlfriend in the past and we had a relationship. Right. And um, you did that why? I didn't want you to go through the ordeal that I had gone through. On the day of Miss Raimundo's murder, um, Mrs. Sessler, you had a swollen red knuckle, a red mark on the side of your face wrapping around your ear, and scratches on your back, correct? Not to my knowledge. After two weeks, the trial eventually ended in a guilty verdict for Sheila Davalou. She was sentenced to 50 years in prison, and she was already serving 25 years for the attempted murder of Paul Christos. I'd like to, after thanking God, thank my family for their continued support in the past 10 years. I'd like to thank everybody at the Department of Corrections in both uh, New York and Connecticut. Hope that this punishment that your honor will hand down today will bring them some, some kind of closure. So good riddance to Sheila Davalou, who would later be interviewed by Piers Morgan. Uh, you know, saying, still saying to this day, you know, she would appeal, 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 start arguing she wasn't the one to kill. Annalisa Raimundo. What people have said to us about you, you're a serial liar, you're a psychopath, you think you're smarter than everybody else, mm -hmm. you're brutal, mm -hmm. you're capable of acts of appalling savagery. You're a murderer. When you get in there, she'll try and manipulate you, mm -hmm. but she's a cold-blooded killer. That's what they say about you. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel? I just feel that people don't know me. How you never went anywhere near Annalisa's apartment? Absolutely not. I am certain that I wasn't there um, in that area. But there's also questions of if this was the only murder Sheila Davalou committed. Because listen to this, in 2017, 15 years after she killed Annalisa, she was questioned, Sheila was questioned about the unsolved murder of 32-year-old Nancy Smith. Nancy was killed on the 5th of December 2001 in New Windsor, New York, not far from where Sheila was living at the time. Nancy was found in her home, stabbed to death. Now the case is strikingly similar to what happened to Annalisa. Nancy likely let the killer in, there had been a struggle, and she was then stabbed to death. And Nancy and Sheila had formerly been co-workers at Oxford Health in the 90s. As I said, Sheila was questioned about this as there were eer eerie similarities between what happened to Nancy Smith and what happened to Annalisa Raimundo. You know, the attack with the knife, walk like knocking on the door, being let in, uh, you know, stabbing her to death in her own house. Very, very similar. And the fact that they worked together was their previous love triangle or something like that. But, um... That was really it. They couldn't find any strong links between the two of them. They worked at the same place, but it's they don't even know if they knew each other. They might just work for the same company. And Sheila, of course, says she has nothing to do with it. Just like she says she has nothing to do with Annalisa's murder. So I guess, you know, we can take her at her word. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, watching this whole video with me means a lot. Um, yeah. So I hope you found us as uh, twisting and weird. Kind of like a big love pile of shit. That's really the best way of describing it. Maybe I'll call this video that. But until next one, which will be in a couple of days, um, I'll see you then. As always, please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. Mike out.